Okay, um, welcome to uh, sizing your OpenStack cloud development session. First of all, I'll uh, just talk about me for a very short moment. Then, um, what is uh, uh, what are the assumptions and use cases behind sizing your OpenStack um, cloud environment? The approach we take. A few words about the architecture of OpenStack, and then we'll actually come to the actual cloud sizing and where, in the very end, where you could go from here. Also, Stepping Stone was founded roughly 12 years ago. Um, since more or less the beginning of the company, we've been focused on cloud computing. Um, we always updated or um, expanded our services with managed services like backup, storage, monitoring, standby duty, stuff like that. And additionally, we also sell consulting services based on our um, knowledge that we built up over the last 12 years. Let's talk about the approach. Um, first of all, I will, I'll define some use cases. We'll have a look into the architecture of OpenStack. We'll see how we can actually um, simplify the Open Act, uh, OpenStack architecture into um, different layers to make the whole calculation a bit easier. And finally, uh, we'll actually uh, calculate the numbers, um, the servers I need, taking the average size of the VM, the redundancy, performance, stuff like that, into consideration. The average virtual machine today that we offer on our own platform is about one and a half CPUs, four gigabyte of RAM, and around 30 gigabyte of disk. So we expect in the near future that the VMs will grow larger. So in this calculation, um, we'll take two, two CPUs, eight gigabyte of RAM, and 50 gigabyte of storage for our average VM. Then I'll look into three different use cases. One, the, uh, the first would be a, a proof of concept that can be used for testing, for development with around 50 virtual machines. Then maybe a private cloud or a small public cloud where we're talking um, up to 500 virtual machines. And finally, talk about a large private cloud or a small to medium public cloud with up to 5,000 machines. The OpenStack architecture is fairly complex, as most of you probably know. Good thing about OpenStack is that a lot of functionality is uh, encapsulated into components or, in OpenStack speak, into projects. And we can also um, actually simplify this view once more into four logical layers. On the first logical layer, the control nodes, as a control layer, is where you have all the stuff that you would need to actually run your cloud apart from storage and the computing. Stuff like telemetry, identity management, uh, dashboards, API access, all this kind of stuff um, we put into the control layer. Then on the next layer, we have the compute layer. This is where more or less where the VMs um, take their memory and CPU from. Then we have the storage layer, where the images and volumes are stored. And finally, we have the uh, physical network, as all the servers, elements in our infrastructure need to be connected with each other. I start off with the control and compute hardware. I'm taking this together to make it a bit easier. So, what do I need to consider um, for the costs and also for the sizing of my uh, control nodes? Well, 
every country has different laws, but in Switzerland we have the possibility to um, write off the machines, the servers, over three to five years. In this case, I've chosen four, ye uh, four years, 48 months. As OpenStack is still uh, developing very rapidly and we have to more or less update the whole infrastructure at least once a year to be up to date, uh, the installation costs will be amortized over uh, 12 months. Operation costs is done monthly. And then every control or compute node needs a local disk or local disks for the operating system. You could also choose to boot uh, from a TFTP server, but in a lot of cases, it's easier to actually work with the local operating systems. For the control nodes, I will also uh, need local disk storage because most of the functionality I throw into different VMs. And so that's what the local storage is for. You'll also want to um, make uh, a compromise between CPU frequency, CPU power, and power consumption. And finally, because you're running more than one system on the control nodes and compute nodes, you probably want to have a, a redundant power system and a redundant network interfaces. When I take all this into consideration, I came to a small server as a small uh, single unit server where um, I calculate with two CPUs and for, for starters with 256 gigabyte of RAM. And here I um, looked into what are my operating costs, what are my amortization costs for the installation, and what is the amortization costs for the actual hardware. And the interesting thing is, especially looking at how high salaries are in Switzerland, the more CPUs or the more cores I actually have, the cheaper the machine is, even taking into consideration, well, not the machine, the actual vCPU gets cheaper the more I stuff into one machine. Out of curiosity, I did the same calculation with 512 gigabyte of RAM, and the effect is still the same, just with a small offset for the memory. Now, before actually going on to the um, storage layer, just a short overview how um, ZEF, that's the storage that we use, um, is built up. I've got one, three, or five monitors that are responsible for the for the all the um, sorry <laughs> for the object storage demons, and for the object storage demons, I can have one to uh, more or less thousands of nodes, each containing one or more um, operate, uh, open storage demons. Each op um, object storage demon is responsible for a single disk. So the great thing about Ceph is the more disk I actually add, the higher the complete throughput is. In the following calculation, I just added the three monitors upon the OSD nodes for simplification. Now to the storage hardware. Again, we have the whole amortization section, but where it really um, gets interesting is how do I actually store the data on my disks? I have well, for the operating disks, today we only use solid state disks because they're um, a lot more reliable than the hard disks. For the journal that is responsible to, uh, as a, the journal disk has a high impact on um, the whole throughput of my system. So there we actually take NVOM Express solid state disks. And finally, for the hard disk, I have for the, uh, the actual data storage, I have the choice between the classical hard disks, solid state disks, or again, NVOM Express solid state disks. When I take all these points again into consideration, it's clear, hard, um, I calculated actually two 
um, small to medium storage nodes. The small one has around uh, 20 gigabyte of disk space, uh, sorry, 20 terabyte of disk space. The medium one then has about 40 terabyte of disk space. Disk space. As expected, the hard disks are the cheapest by a high margin, and every technology jump more or less doubles my costs. So to have a more or less cost-effective cloud, hard disks um, just, it's just not quick enough, because the more VMs I actually add to a cloud, the more important is also the throughput, throughput of my storage. NVMe solid state disk is currently way too expensive, at least for us. So now to the network hardware. Here, the really interesting thing is what kind of bandwidth do my switches uh, support and are the switches expandable? I could start off with one gigabit per sec second interfaces and go up to 100 gigabit. Today, uh, 10 gigabit is the most uh, cost-effective solution, especially when you think that mostly you would have attach every single node twice. So you need two interfaces per node that you actually want to add to your cloud. Again, so I've got the 10 gigabit um, interface, and we're actually using Netgear switches that scale up to 72 10 gigabit <coughs> ports per um, switch. And here it's quite interesting that the price difference between 48 and 72 isn't even that big anymore. But still, if I've got a small cloud, I'll probably only stick to 24 10 gigabit switches and uh, ports, and definitely not 48 or 72. That's the nice thing about scalable switches, where you can just add in more modules when you need more ports. So what is the idea behind the cloud sizing? Again, I'm talking about four layers. So normally I would have one to two control nodes. The compute nodes are actually uh, dependent either on the number of CPUs I want to sell or the amount of memory I want to sell. In this case, the higher number of servers is the one I have to choose because either one, either memory or CPU will be the the factor that limits my system. Storage nodes, Ceph actually um, saves all the storage um, normally out of the box on three different OSDs. So to make the whole calculation easier, I just said I'll take the total storage need, divide it um, by the storage preserver, and then again multiply it by three so I actually get the netto storage space that I need. For storage nodes, it's also quite important that you think about um, over as a, if I take a snapshot of a VM that also gets um, stored on the same storage nodes, and you'll also have to keep enough empty space if one of your storage nodes fails, because then in the background, Ceph starts to rebalance data and tries to make sure that all data is stored three times again. This gives me now, for the proof of concept, well, it actually more or less falls out of the whole picture, because when I've only got 50 virtual machines, I could actually more or less run it on one system. A lot of um, testing can be done on one system. Mm. But again, because I like to have a certain redundancy, here I would choose three nodes and one 24 10 gigabit switch. Well, actually, that's overkill, but just to stick with the same hardware. Now, with a small public cloud, it gets a bit more interesting. Again, for the control nodes, one server would actually be enough, uh, looking at the performance. But now I'm coming into a range where you're selling um, your services, so you need to have a reliable system, so you duplicate the control nodes. 
taking now those 500 machines into consideration that I had before, so with two vCPUs, 8 gigabyte of RAM and 50 gigabyte of disks, I get four numbers, uh, depending on the size, uh, either vCPUs or memory. And as mentioned before, I need 18 um, physical compute nodes to be actually um, sell a reliable service without any overbooking. You can lower these numbers if you actually start to overbook your CPU, but then it um, it's, depends on your business model if you can actually do that to or with your customers. For the storage nodes, um, actually three of the small storage nodes would be enough. And so that means in the total I have 25 servers, so I can divide that over two um, network switches, again, two for the reliability, because every server will then be connected to different switches. The medium cloud has a bit more requirements that also needs a lot of organization in your automa automa automation team. Again, two control nodes. Here you might come into um, performance issues, so you might want to think if you want to um, put certain services like telemetry or networking nodes on physical machines. Compute nodes, I come up to nearly 180 machines with my two servers set up. So to save energy and also initial costs, uh, four-way servers, so also again, single unit boxes but with four CPUs would make more sense in this case. Storage nodes are also, uh, is quite a high number now with 18 servers or 18 nodes with 40 terabyte each. But well, at least I'll get a nice throughput this way. Network switches, I now need six pieces with, 20, uh, with 72 gigabit, 10 gigabit ports. And here, now I have to start with um, top of rack switches where I need to connect these switches with higher velocity, for instance, 40 gigabit per second or even 100 gigabit. So where to go from here now? Um, just a short calculation how you could size your clouds. Depending on your needs, you'll, you, ever you might want to expand your con compute nodes with um, high integrated servers. You would um, move your heavy load VMs on the control node layers away. You would actually um, use larger storage nodes, but there you have to be very careful that you don't, uh, that the impact on your f total throughput isn't too high. But a very easy way to actually um, make the throughput higher would then be to separate the front end network to the VMs with the back end network that Ceph uses for rebalancing. And as just mentioned, you would want to have um, quicker network switches. So, um, am I still in time? I hope so, probably, yeah. Uh, I hope I gave you a short idea what you would have to look into when you want to um, plan your cloud on paper before you actually start with the implementation. You do need to know what, what kind of workload that you actually have. So even with the solid state disks, in certain cases, that could be an overkill. As if you have a lot of mass storage, then you probably um, split the storage into two different kinds. Um, solid state disks or even NVMe solid state disks for the virtual machines with databases, stuff like that. And then the backups and um, snapshots, you would then relocate onto lower storage. Ceph actually would also offer a possibility to, uh, to actually mix these in the same storage. But to be honest with you, I do not know how that performs. 
And then, do you need redundancy or not? If yes, how much? And last but not least, what is your budget? The approach that I took now is a mixture between performance and the budget, budget restriction. Yeah. Well, that's it. Anybody interested in the numbers um, can contact me personally after this session.